So let's get started. This is the fourth reading. This is about uh, Mithridates, so obviously it's a continuation of our stories from last week with Marius and Sulla. So just to make sure that we connect these two uh, stories together, we look back at the previous one. We ended uh, with Sulla heading out to Asia, right? When we say Asia, we're talking about um, Asia Minor. So, Saul is on his way to deal with uh, Mithridates, right, this, this foreign king. Uh, and we start here in this line with the word enim. Enim always goes as the second word, right? It never goes first, it always goes second. So it connects the previous thought. So why was, um, why was Saul heading off to Asia Minor? Because, right, turn the size down that on a little bit. Uh, Mithridates here in the uh, nominative case. And then we get a qui, right? So qui is starting off a relative clause. Qui ponti rex erat. So Mithridates, qui ponti rex, right? I told you guys, genitives are snugglers, right? They like to hang out in the middle there. Uh, so because Mithridates, who was... Rex Ponti was the king of Pontus. That's the name of his kingdom. Pontus is also just the Greek word for sea. So it's a kingdom that's on the sea. We'll talk about which sea that is in just a second. Uh, atque, so we have a conjunction here. And now it would be really easy for you to say he was the king of Pontus and Armenia. But that's not what we got here, because if he was the king of Pontus and the king of Armenia, this would have to be in the genitive case. So these two words being accusative means I got to wait for my next verb. So Armenia minorem, accusative. Totum ponticum mare, because it's neuter, could be nominative, could be accusative. Here it is definitely um, in the accusative case. In circuitu. Ablative, little prep phrase. Cum bosforo, also ablative. And then we get our second verb in the clause, which is tenebat, right? So because Mithridates, who was the king of Pontus, and I gotta jump all the way down here to tenebat, who was king of Pontus and was holding, in the sense of like controlling, uh, Armenia minor, lesser Armenia. Really no need to translate that. That was just the kingdom. It was a, a region, Armenia Minor. And the totum ponticum mare, the entire mare ponticum, the Pontic Sea, this was the old, uh, an old word for the Black Sea. So if you know your geography, okay, Zooming out a little bit here so we can get a sense. Here's Turkey, big old Turkey, okay? Greece is over here to the west of Turkey, and of course, Italy is to the west of that. So you figure when we uh, are talking about Armenia um, Minor, it's kind of like North Turkey here. <clears throat> it's not the Armenia that we knew, right? That's been shifted a bit. So this is the Black Sea, right? It's kind of like the Mediterranean of Eastern Europe, right? It's kind of a sea that's smack dab in the middle of a bunch of countries. Um, whereas obviously the Mediterranean is a little bit bigger here. Here's the Mediterranean. Black Sea is much smaller, but it is kind of this centrally located body of water. So it allows for all of these different cultures to easily uh, interact with one another. So zooming in on where we are, right? And going back to our text here for a second. Uh, he was holding Armenia Minor and the entire Black Sea in Kirkuitu cum Bosforo. So he wasn't really holding the entire Black Sea, although that is literally what it says. He's holding the, the Black Sea in a circle with the Bosphorus, which is a straight, right? So a little bit of a geography lesson. The Bosphorus, this strait right here, is kind of uh, 
intersecting, it kind of cuts off Turkey, right? Geographically speaking, from the more Western parts of, uh, of Europe. So it's kind of where the East and West meet. So when we say that he was holding Armenia in a circuit with the Bosphorus, basically meaning like his boundary of territory is the edge of the water all the way up to the Bosphorus. So he's basically controlling this whole region. If you imagine you follow the edge of the water all the way to the Bosphorus, and then he's got this big round uh, territory that he controls, okay? Minor geography lesson for you. So Mithridates, who was king of Pontus and was holding all of that territory in a big old circle, primum nicomedain, we start off here with, this could be accusative or it could be the adverb, I think we'll go with the adverb here, first, right? Nicomedain, that is in the accusative, and obviously the first thing you notice is why in the world is there an N at the end. I'll give you guys a Blue's Clues moment to see if you can figure it out. Blue's Clues. <laughs> so this guy's name is Nicomedes. Nicomedes is the king of Bithynia. So let's... Uh, Bithynia. Oh, Google Maps doesn't like Bithynia. Probably because Bithynia is no longer a region on Earth, right? Uh, but it is a part... Ooh, I like this map. If we look at... Uh, this is the map I want. This is the money map right here, right? So we have Armenia Minor down here, right? Oh, let me... Um, you guys can't see that. How do I move this window? There we go, right? So you can see here's Turkey. So Pontus over here, that's Mithridates' home base. He now controls Armenia Minor, right? In a big old circle here. We're gonna see later he goes into Paphlagonia, he goes into Bithynia, all the way to where that little strait is. So you're looking at sort of the, the growing empire of Mithridates as he's um, trying to take over the region. And the Pontus Euxinus up here, that's the Black Sea. That's the, the Pontic Sea. It's another name for it. Okay, so this is the area that we are uh, talking about. Now remember, all the way over here to the west is uh, Greece. Even further to the west is Italy. So I'm going to have to move this window again when I flip floppy this. There we go. Okay, so going back to this name, right, Nicomedain that's not a, a Latin ending, right? You would expect an M or something. And that's because th his name is Greek. And so you have this Eastern area that we're talking about. And a lot of times when the Romans would use those names, because the Romans were usually bilingual, they could speak Latin, they could speak Greek. They would use those names with the case endings from the original Greek. So anytime you see an ain on the end, it's just a, an M, right? It's the accusative ending. So Nicomedain, in the accusative, he's described as amicum populi romani, and that's a legal term we'll get into in just a second. Bithynia, with a nice long A, is in the ablative case. Woluit is our third person singular, that's our verb. And then wolo typically hangs out with an infinitive. So we have to remember that the previous line, we got Mithridates, and then we got a relative clause about Mithridates. So Mithridates, who blah, 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 then we have to get the actual verb that he's doing, and that verb is woluit. So what did Mithridates do? Mithridates wanted to expellera. Don't have to dig too deep for that one. He wanted to expel. He wanted to kick out an accusative. He wanted to kick out Nicomedes. My comedy is it sometimes the way it's pronounced. He wanted to expel Nicomedes, Nicomedes. He's described as a friend, oops, a friend of the Roman people. He wanted to expel him, Bithynia. So there's no E here, there's no X. Sometimes the prepositions get left out. 
he wanted to expel Nicomedes from Bithynia. Bithynia. Now, a friend of the Roman people is not just somebody who's nice, right? Rome at this point is already an empire, and Rome has influence in a large swath of the geographical area. So when someone is a friend of the Roman people, that means they're an ally of the Roman people. So that is somebody who was either put in power by Rome, because Rome kind of controls that region, or that is a foreign king who has allied themselves to Rome. So it's much stronger than just, oh, he seems to be nice to Rome. That's an ally of the Roman people. That's somebody who's uh, on Team Rome. So what does Mithridates want to do? And I forgot the primum here, so let's just put it at the very beginning. He wanted to first, we'll put it here. He wanted to first expel Nicomedes, a friend of the Roman people, from Bithynia. So going back to our map, right? Where we got our map? There's our map, right? Uh, he wanted to expel Nicomedes from uh, Bithynia. So he wants to kick out um, a king, essentially. So this verb, woluit, right? Wolo takes a complementary infinitive. He wanted to expel, he wanted to kick out Nicomedes, friend of the Roman people, kick him out from Bithynia. Senatuique, right? Senatuique mandawit. So this que here is and. So he first wanted to do the first thing he said, which is expel Nicomedes. And then, senatui, which is in the dative case, mandawit. Mandawit's your verb, third person, singular, perfect. Now, we had a nice conversation, me and another student, about this word mandare, because you look it up in the dictionary and it's going to say mandare to command, right, or to give a command. As the language progressed, giving commands would become, as the territorial expanse was growing, you would be sending somebody a letter telling them what to do, right? The command would be given over a long distance. So mandare kind of just means to give word to someone, right? It's not commanding in the sense of the person in front of me. It can be used that way, but it can also be used to say, I told my friends across the universe over there to do something. So when we say mandawit senatui, he didn't command the Senate. It's almost like he gave a demand to the Senate. So we could think of this as delivering a message. Uh, he delivered a message to the Senate, the Roman Senate. So he wanted to kick out Nicomedes and... He gave word to the Roman Senate. He told the Roman Senate. Then we have balum in the accusative. We have se in the accusative. We have ei in the dative case. We have propter, which is a preposition. And it's a preposition that goes with the accusative case. Then we have a relative clause here, quas in the accusative. Passus fuerat, if you remember from the last section, passus est, or passus erat, would be what you would normally expect. This is passus fuerat. So this is what I called in the last video, I believe I referred to it as the super pluperfect. Because it's like pluperfect, pluperfect. Because it's not just passus erat, it's passus fuerat. It's just even more in the past. So the main sentence is in the past. We're going past, 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 past. Okay. And then we have in laturam, which is a uh, future active. It is a participle, but the idea here is that essa would have been uh, included. So really what we have here is an infinitive, right? It's an infinitive with the essa missing. So it's basically just a participle. I say that because we have a bunch of accusatives and we have an infinitive at the end. So we've got an indirect statement. So what is the message he delivered to the Senate? He told the Senate that bellum se 
in laturum esse. These two words together, bellum and in laturum, from in latus, from in ferro, means to bring war on somebody, basically to declare war. So this accusative is either the subject or the direct object. And this say is either the subject or the direct object. And normally we expect the subject to go first, but if that were the case, it would say war would bring, it just doesn't work, right? So say here is the subject. He delivered the message, he being Mithridates, he delivered a message to the Senate that he, Mithridates, in laturum bellum, he would declare war et e, the dative case, on, and the et e that, he's, that he means, grammatically speaking, is the Senate, right? He would declare war on the Roman Senate, which is like saying declaring war on Rome. He would declare war on the Senate, right? He told the Senate that he would declare war on them, propter injurias, because of, or on account of, the injurias, Yuria, injuria, it's all about, uh, I mean, if you think about that, I-N-I would become I-N-J, so injurias would become injurias. So on account of the injustices, injuries, uh, slights, attacks, there's a couple different ways that you can think of it. Uh, the in I like the injustices. On account of the injustices, quas passus fuerat, the injustices which passus fuerat, he, meaning Mithridates, which he had endured, he had suffered. So obviously there's a bit of backstory here, but the Romans and, and, and Mithridates have been going at it for some time. So uh, he basically decided he was going to kick out Nicomedes, the friend of, you know, a friend of Rome, uh, and he said he was going to declare war on them because of all of the injustices that he had suffered at the hands of the Romans. So he's basically puffing out his chest and making some, some threats. One last thing on this slide is Quas here being accusative because he had suffered the injuries. Right? So he's the subject, the injuries here, the direct object. And patior, this verb to suffer, is deponent, which is why it looks passive. Right? The injuries which he had suffered. So because of those injuries, right, he told the Senate that he was going to uh, declare war on them. That's where we are. And last part here, okay, funky construction. Thank you, Latin. We have a senatu. I put a message in the Discord about this last night for those of you who uh, look at that. A couple different ways we can look at this. I personally take it as what's called an impersonal construction. So responsum est is the perfect passive. It was responded. That's one way you can think of it. You could also think of it as the response from the Senate to Mithridates is. That's a more literal translation, and it happens to work here in this situation because it was responded to. It's an easy noun to come up with a response, but you can have certain situations in Latin where it would be like... Um, it was crossed by the Romans. Uh, we're talking about like a river, for instance, and they would say it was crossed by the Romans. What that really means is the Romans crossed the river. So in this situation, you could go either way. You could do the very literal, uh, the response from the Senate to Mithridates is, or you can think of it the way um, I do, because it means the same thing either way. Uh, is third singular perfect passive. Uh, so it's responsum est. And the literal translation here, and this est is going with responsum, just so you know. So it's responsum, put them in bold so they go together. 
it was responded to Mithridates by the Senate, aka the Senate responded to Mithridates. Okay. And what's the response? Right? Obviously, we got to tell you what the response is. C id facaret. C means if. So that's a conditional statement. Uh, we may have to review those. If id facaret, third person singular, that is imperfect subjunctive. We're going to see that uh, conditional statements have particular translations that you uh, kind of go to. This is weird. He responded, the Senate responded, that. And normally we would think of it as indirect statement. But as the language started to change, they would use the word quad. Essentially because the response, which was this, right? So that's a, a later Latin kind of invention. He responded that accusative, bellum, a romanis, right? ablative, Ipse here, nominative, and then paterator is my other verb. So conditionals are always if-then statements, right? The Senate responded that if, and since it's subjunctive, what it means when you have an if statement in the subjunctive is it's hypothetical. The Senate responded to Mithridates that if he were to do it, it meaning what he mentioned he was going to do before, which is declare war. So the Senate responded that if he should declare war, if he were to declare war, that quad, ipse, if he were to do it, he himself, Mithridates, paterator, he himself would endure, would suffer, bellum, war, a Romanis, from the Romans. So there's a lot of blustering happening going back and forth. Basically, Mithridates said that he was going to declare war on the Romans. The Senate responded, if you do that, you're the one who's going to be suffering war. And notice that he uses the same verbs, right? Paterator is a form of patior, pasus fuerat. They use, you know, it's a, it's a very specific vocabulary. He said he was going to declare war because of the injustices which he had suffered. And the Roman response is, oh, you want to suffer? You're going to suffer war, right? That's what we're going to bring to you if you declare war on us. So a little bit of gamesmanship going on there, of course. Okay. Uh, and we'll end it there. We'll pick it up tomorrow with uh, Mithridates' response, which, spoiler alert, he just starts conquering more and more people. So bring it on. All right, guys. See you tomorrow.